In a world where change is the only constant, Mo Shamil stands at the forefront, guiding title professionals to not just grow their businesses, but to master the art of innovation. With every episode, you're handed the keys to unlock unparalleled growth and stay ahead of the curve. Get ready for a transformative journey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Title Agents Podcast. I am your host, Mo Shamil, uh, Alltech National Title CEO. Today, we're joined by Nancy Guzman, uh, Guzman, Esquire, a highly respected real estate attorney and former president of the MLTA, it's the Maryland Land Title Association, with over 35 years of experience. Nancy has been at the forefront of many industry changes and challenges. Get ready for an insightful conversation filled with practical advice and expert perspectives that can help you navigate the complexities of our profession. Welcome, Nancy. Hey, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, well, let's start off uh, with uh, give us a little background and um, and uh, y- your story. Okay. Well, I have been a um, real estate attorney since the mid '80s. Um, I have over the years developed a specialty in dealing with all those hard to do transactions. Um, usually the ones that other title companies don't want. Um, I deal a lot with real estate investors. Um, I am like really good at cleaning up issues in the back title that other people don't know how to do. Um, at one point, I was underwriting counsel for a national title insurance company. So sometimes I can get through things because I know how to talk to the underwriters. So. That's basically, you know, what I've been doing. Um, uh, it, and recently, I've decided to start doing uh, some consulting to title companies and help them with their operations and systems. Awesome. Uh, you, you've been, you've seen the title industry evolve over the past few decades. Uh, what major challenges do title professionals face today that are different from the, the past, if any? So the industry is always evolving but at the same time staying the same. So what I see is that we have an evolution of technology, we have an evolution of compliance issues, but as far as the day-to-day processes and operations that I see in title companies, for the most part, they're still doing it the same way we did it back in the 80s. And and I see this like not just in our area, but like all over the country. It's like it, It's like people got stuck on the processes. And what they don't realize is that your processes have to evolve also because you have new, more complex issues and you have um, more liability. Um, And what's happening is that a lot of people are not realizing that some of these new liability issues that have come up are not covered by their title insurance. Um, And so now they're stuck with their E&O carrier and then they find out that they didn't notify the E&O carrier timely based on what was in their policy and now the e and o carrier is saying yeah well we don't have to cover the claim so so you know i i, I kind of i'm seeing this evolution but i'm also seeing people stuck in the past and you know that's a problem yeah that's uh this is something the show is all about is really honoring the legacy and then kind of reteaching the title professionals how to evolve and adapt technology Mm-hmm. Uh, can you let's dig a little deeper into this? It's like a very, um, very passionate about that. Lily is said, uh, out of the legacy, but uh, how do we move forward? How do we be, how do we become more efficient at that technology, mm-hmm. uh, automation, and just more to, to kind of be more efficient and work smarter, not harder as an industry? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, some uh, one of the things is um, having quality control in your office. Um, what and, does that and- mean? So quality control, making sure that before anything leaves your office, whether it's via email or going to this table or whatever it is, that another pair of eyes is looking over it. We are very, very detail-oriented industry, and it's very easy for details to get lost in the process. Um, And so um, it's important to make sure that that a second pair of eyes looks over everything whether it's your CDs and your head ones or your binders or your policies. Um, you know, it's scary, it's scary for a second that every email has to be reviewed. I'm like, there are like no, 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 500 no, no, emails no. Just, of the transaction. No, your documents, your documents. <laughs> um, but 
but it's also it's also having consistency in your systems. So I've been in offices where each processor processes the, their files their way. And there's no consistency among the people in the office as to how things get done. And that's, a, you know, that's a, that creates liability because if not everybody's doing the same thing and you don't know what they're doing, then you don't know whether there's going to be, that, whether that could create a claim later. I was, uh, what do you think the cause of that? Like if you have different... Uh... I'm obviously talking about the the, the the DMV or the East Coast where it's very mm -hmm. highly fragmented. I'm pretty confident it does not happen in the West Coast when you have these big uh, mega title agencies. And yeah. Well, no, I think that it does happen all over the country. Yeah. I think that oftentimes we, we hire somebody who has experience and we just trust that their experience is going to, is that they do it right. And we just let them do it the way they like to do it. Um, when I had my last title company, I had um, a strict set of policies and procedures, and they had to follow those. And when I, whenever I hired experienced people, they came in and they they pushed back. Well, they know I've it all. Done it that way. <laughs> yeah, I've never done it that way before. Well, I want everybody in my office doing it the same way. And so you're going to have to adapt if you want to work here. Um, I was I was I was in this one office where everybody's doing things differently, and one of the processors, even the you know the our side docs, our internal docs that we yeah. put out, she, she each person is using a different set of internal docs going to the table, and one of the processors, the um, compliance agreement, she always puts out the one for the lender instead of the one for the title company, so now the title company is not protected on that compliance. Because the wrong document was set to the table. So what, uh, best in your experience, what's the best way, what, what message or how can you advise uh, managers um, and how kind of to, to build that kind of, uh, and that consistent processes and systems and how do you have those conversations? Obviously it's better early on when you, before you hire a person than after the fact or. Right. Yep. So, um, you know, <laughs> I've been, I, I do a lot of business consulting outside of the title industry as well. And, you know, one of the things that um, is very recited often is, you know, look at McDonald's, look at your franchises. And you can go into any McDonald's anywhere in the country. And, the world. <laughs> or the world. And you are going to get the exact same thing. So Big down man. to down to how many pickles are on your sandwich and where they're placed on the sandwich. Okay. And that creates consistency for the customer. And they know that anytime they walk into McDonald's, they're going to get the exact yeah. same. You should have that in your title company. That whenever anybody walks into your office, and if you're a multi-office company, then any one of your offices, people are going to get the exact same service every time they come in it creates consistency and your and your customers and your clients are going to appreciate that and come back um, it also helps you avoid liability issues because if everything's being done the same way every time then you're not going to have a problem and here's a liability issue people don't think about and that is if you terminate an employee and i had to terminate somebody at one point and she filed an unemployment claim and I've told unemployment, I said, look, I have written policies and procedures. She signed off having read them and she didn't follow them. And it specifically stated that this particular incident would be uh, grounds for, for immediate termination. I was covered with unemployment because I had that in my policies and procedures. So, um, you know, it protects you from, from things that you don't think about. Um, and it also protects you from things that you might think about. So, you know, if you have a, if you have a set way of handling wires and you can have a problem with a, with a, either a wire that didn't come in properly or a wire that didn't go out properly, but you have that system set up properly, then you're probably not going to ha have too much of, um, an issue if somebody tries to sue you. And especially when it comes to funding, that's uh, the one mm -hmm. spot where you cannot freelance or deviate. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if you know that your systems are being done the same way every time, um, you know, it, you're, you're reducing your liability. You're also reducing your costs. So 
<laughs> uh, I mean, think think about all of those rejected recordings that are costing you money, but, or, or a, every time something's left off of a HUD one or a CD. Yeah, as a past president of the MLTA mm-hmm. and an active member of various industry groups, uh, what advocacy efforts are you currently involved in to protect both health professionals and consumers? So I am very active with Alta. Um, and their advocacy issues. That's American Land Title Association. Yes, so American Land Somebody Land. doesn't know the <laughs> abbreviation. Yes, um, I'm very active um, with them, and I get and I jump on things. Um, what committee of, are you serving on? Right now, I'm on the membership committee, and I'm on the um, homeowners outreach program committee. Oh, I think I've been um, on it for a few years. <laughs> yeah, um, and I'm on a several subcommittees as well. Um, and, oh, I'm also on the marketing um, work group. So can you just maybe a little di- just a couple of minutes on each? Uh, obviously, membership, you want to get more members, and why, why is that important to the industry? Yeah. So, membership. So membership in your land title association, and you should be active in both your state and the national. Um, you, your membership there is where you're going to be able to make change at a legislative level. So if, if you're facing issues in your business that are, um, that are you know, limited to our industry and we need legislative change on it, then the way that we're getting that is through your trade associations. And so you need to be active in your trade associations in order to be able to make those change. So the Mass of the Membership Committee, I'm trying to not just recruit members, but make sure that we are providing the members of the association with the things that they need. One of the things that I was involved in creating was a program where um, they sponsor um, some of the smaller agents to be able to go to their conferences because their conferences are expensive and smaller agents can't necessarily afford it. And so we've created a program so that um, people can, can get there who ordinarily would not be able to. The so the HOP or the Home Ownership Outreach Program is educating consumer. Yes, and I where where we all do as a, as an industry do a poor job of educating the consumer. Uh, so that's a want to dive a little little deeper on this. Yeah. And people can... um, so the HOP committee um, works on educating the consumers on um, title insurance, what it is, why homeowners need it, um, and you know. Uh, what the title company is doing so that you never have to make a claim on that title insurance policy. Um, and so that's, that's basically what the HOP committee does. Um, they're also branching out now into educating people about, you know, some of the settlement processes that occur also. Awesome. And what's, uh, I, mean, I, I don't, I don't want to get the, the whole push for Fannie Mae and Fannie Mac for the penny letter. I don't know if you have anything to say about that or you know, how do you feel about it or. Um, Fannie Mae had backed off of it and then all of a sudden some, but they got the ear of somebody in the white house and they were back on it. Um, Congress is as a, as a, as a, as a whole, uh, a, a, and bipartisanly, I guess that's a word. Um, they, Congress is not really in favor of this. Congress understands the importance of title insurance and they also understand that when Fannie Mae's accepting these attorney opinion letters or these alternate products, whatever they are, that they're not really protecting the people that they think they're protecting. And uh, I think the, and uh, the, probably the biggest risk is like the, the, the lender, especially given a opinion letter to a lender, they want a tower agent to be more uh, responsible and carry the risk. Now you don't right, have right. that underwrite that title insurance policy to put as a backup for the agent. Well, and it's also, you know, I don't see a whole lot of attorneys jumping on this. The liability. Because of the liability to the attorneys. I mean, our 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 malpractice carriers are not gonna want us doing this. And and so we're gonna have to charge a lot of money to do it. So we're not saving anybody any money doing an attorney opinion letter. Yeah, that that was my my uh, personal assessment and like the because our industry is very labor intensive. It may not come across like the general public lenders, realtors, they may not see it, but it's very expensive labor force, it's very highly knowledgeable, very skilled. Mm-hmm. So it's going to cost a certain amount of money to do a transaction to be profitable. 
whether it's title insurance or not. If there's no title insurance, we're going to have to up our fees or escrow fees, mm-hmm. whatever those the, those may be. Right. Yeah, exactly. 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 And, um, and the other thing is that, you know, the only, they're only doing this on refinances of low risk loans. Well, your low risk loans are your people in your higher socioeconomic um, categories. So yeah. if, you're trying to help, if you're trying to help <laughs> the people who are middle to low income, that's, this isn't doing anything for them. Absolutely. So how can title agents get more involved in industry advocacy to help shape the future of our profession? Um, join your um, join your state land title association, join American Land Title Association, and become a member of TAN. Um, TAN is Title Action Network, which is uh, run through ALTA. And you do not have to be a member of ALTA to be a member of TAN. But when legislative issues come up, they will send out emails to everybody um, with with a pre, pre-programmed pre letter so that you can send a letter to your state representatives in Congress and, um, you, know, you're, to, you know, Congress or at a state level. Um, and you can send out these letters and, you know, make our voices heard. You know, unfortunately, we're the smallest piece of the real estate industries. So our voices get heard the least. The realtors and the mortgage companies have a much louder voice than we do because they're bigger than we are. Awesome. You mentioned the importance of addressing internal challenges in the title, in the title company operation. Mm-hmm. And uh, what are some common operational issues you observe? Um, and what strategies you recommend for overcoming them? Like the, the one thing you mentioned earlier is being consistent and having systems and processes that are consistent across yeah, uh, that's... branches and like, employees. <laughs> what yeah. other things you've seen, the challenges um, or risk that people may so, not be aware. Of? So when you have a reco- rejected recording, yeah, not especially Maryland, it, yeah, especially in Maryland. <laughs> but those have... of, uh, yeah, I think Maryland is probably one of the worst states uh, yeah, to record. Yeah, well, depends on which county you're in, but yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> but when you have a rejected recording, not only is it costing you money, but it's also putting the title insurer at risk because the date of that policy is the date of recording and anything that gets recorded between, between the time that you issued your title insurance commitment and your policy, that's going to be covered in your policy. And so when you, when your recording gets rejected, there's an opportunity for another lien to get thrown in there in, in between. Okay. So that's, that's a problem. And, and how you how you avoid that is you have somebody who puts the recording package together and then you have somebody else who goes behind to make sure that all the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, the checks are correct, and all of those things. So we're, we're always going to have some that get rejected. But, you know, it, you can minimize it. The other thing is to timely get it back out. I've been in offices where I've seen a stack of files on the floor that it's like mm. hip high. And they're all files that were rejected before it existed. <laughs> so for the, for, for the audience in other states of the country, they may not be, we have no idea what we're talking about. So Maryland is about 28 counties. That might as well be 28 states. Each yes. county <laughs> has its own way of doing things. And uh, like literally sometimes, uh, like to record documents may take six months or a year or two years sometimes. Just like it's, it, it, it sounds insane uh-huh. if you're in uh, California or Washington or Texas. But right. it's really, it's a, it costs us literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in the last 10, 20 years, maybe, probably in the seven figure to be honest with you. Yeah, <laughs> it's, absolutely. Uh, mistakes absolutely. and errors. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is, is banking errors. Cause you, again, you need to have somebody who, you know, is coming behind and looking that, but I got, I have gotten caught a number of times where I had put out a preliminary CD and um, it had everything in it that it was supposed to. And then somehow or other, when we went to print the final to go to the table, uh, uh, taxes had been dropped off of it or, or some other big item had just like, you know, computer glitch, it, it dropped off and, you know, we didn't collect for something that we needed to collect. Um, and then now you're going to try to get it back. <laughs> That's good. No, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's literally, it's a, then becomes poor customer service. Like literally, mm-hmm. the and I always uh, tell we we gotta eat a lot of times. It's called cost of doing business. 
Mm-hmm. It's a lot. It's a lot easier to eat that few hundred or a couple thousand dollars versus trying to chase after it. It just kind of makes the company look bad. It, it does. It also, you know, it also is costing the company a lot of money. So, and for the smaller title companies, it could, that could be devastating. Absolutely. Uh, what uh, What other uh, issues, challenges, or risks or blind spots for title agents that you that you see by like, consulting and advising companies that you you want to share with, with the audience? Um, how your title insurance commitments and policies are put together. Hey, what does that mean? Um, are they supposed to be all the same way? Yes, you would think? they are all supposed <laughs> to be the same way. Um, a lot of people do not put enough um, things into their requirements section. Other people put too much in their requirements section. I've seen um, exceptions that were repetitive. So you might have the same exception six times worded differently each time. Um, they don't know where to put second, second and subordinate liens, and they get put in incorrectly in your in their binders and policies. Wouldn't that be a, it's a big risk? Like if you don't uh, mm-hmm. put the, the information accurate, that the policy may not be yep as proper coverage or yep absolutely. And here's some here's another real big problem is just copying. So you get an abstract and it says restrictive covenants at library and folio or book and page, yeah. wherever you are, okay, or instrument number. And you just copy that without looking to see what those covenants are. Well, then you get into things like um, the, um, now I can't remember what that we were just talking about this, Mel. The um, front foot benefits like in Maryland? Like no, that. the well, the front foot benefits are one of them, but the it's a um, whole different language for them. <laughs> yeah, um, but the the um, the right to list um, covenants that, oh, that yeah. people were recording, um, where the real estate company was recording covenants saying that the seller had right to, to list agreements. Yeah. With them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you're not looking, then you don't know they're there, and you're just listing it as an exception, and you're moving forward. But you were required to clear that prior to closing. That's a requirement, not an exception. Correct. So what's the difference between a requirement and and an exception? Just literally, we're kind of dumbing it down to people that may not. Okay. Requirements are things that need to be cleared prior to closing, prior to the issuance of a policy. Like, uh, give an example. So paying off a mortgage. Okay. okay. So these are, you know, you have to pay off the mortgage. Got to make sure the taxes are paid. Got to make sure that homeowners association dues are up to date. Um, uh, Maryland specific, you've got front foot benefit charges. You've got um, ground rent. Um, you need to make sure that those things are paid current and, and cleared prior to closing so that the buyer is not uh, um, taking over something that they didn't expect to take over. Yeah. Um Exceptions are the things that the title insurance co- policy is not going to cover. Okay. Um, such as? Such as future taxes. So taxes after today are on the are on the owner of the property. The title insurance company is not covering that. Future homeowners association dues. Um, standard easements and restrictive covenants um, for your homeowners association. So, you know, we're not covering you for the fact that the HOA didn't want you to put your fence up um, and that kind of stuff. So what, um, what steps can tell professionals take to protect their clients from pitfalls associated with this, uh, like the, with this kind of, uh, uh, Charge no, but by lack of knowledge sometimes, like the or, or mm-hmm. consistency, like it's really sometimes they're consistent or they don't know that. Like I'm gonna say trading, but what else <laughs> can we do to as an industry to create we, that consistency and protect ourselves? We can disclose more. Um, you know, people will will provide a title insurance commitment, and so, and in some states and some jurisdictions, it's required to provide one in advance of closing so that the buyer can review it. Buyers don't know what they're looking at, and so sometimes you have to let them know there is there are front foot benefits on charges on your property that you're going to be responsible for. There is ground rent on your property that you are going to be responsible for. Here is the information for who to contact with regard to making payment on these things. Um, You know, 
for your standard utility easements and your homeowners association covenants and restrictions, that stuff you're going to get from someplace else. So it's not as big of a deal. But those things are, that are unique to a particular property that are going to require that homeowner to do something that they may not expect, we should be disclosing that up front. Uh, given your extensive experience, where do you see the, the future of the tower industry heading, especially with the rise of digital technologies and change in real estate practices? Title insurance is not going to go away. Um, closings are a very local thing. We are still going to be needed. We are still going to be there. We're not going to be put out of business. It's just going to look different. Um, the lenders are not going to want to get rid of us because they don't want to have to learn all the local standards and practices and laws and, and, and such. They're going to rely on us to have that local knowledge and take care of it for them. Let's the purchase uh, transaction. Re refinances that becoming becoming more and more easier, more digital, more it's more yes. national. But purchase it, that one hundred percent you're accurate about it, how yes. local it is. Exactly. We're talking uh, front foot front foot benefits. I bet you people in the rest of the country have no idea what that means. But uh, ground rent is even worse. <laughs> exactly. What uh, do you have a, a favorite quote? Oh, Lord, a favorite quote. Um, I can't, I, I have one and I can't think of it, Mel. <laughs> <laughs> how, how about a favorite book, uh, either of all time or a favorite book you just read recently? Um, I recently read um, a book. <laughs> Um, you now you're catching me off guard, and I, okay. I, I, that's I, my job. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, are, are you a fiction I, or not a fiction reader? I am a fiction reader, um, okay. but I've been reading. I have been reading some like business development books, and I recently read a book that's called um, "Do Good." S H exclamation point T. Okay. Um, and, um, it is, it's, you can say it. <laughs> it's a very, very short little book. Um, and this woman wrote it, um, saying, you know, she was at a point in her life and she needed to make some changes. And she's like, you know what, I'm just going to do what I do in life. And, and you know, you, there's no time like the present to just start doing cool shit. And, nice. and so I really like the book. It was, you know, it's very short. It's a very easy read, but it really inspired me because sometimes, you know, when we're self-employed, sometimes we kind of get stuck in the, in what I call the quicksand yep. and, we can't, and we can't get out and we know we need to move in a different direction, but we just can't figure out which direction it is that we should be moving to get out of the quicksand. And this is kind of inspired me to get out of the quicksand. Awesome. Uh, any last words for our audience? Um, I want to encourage all of those title company owners out there to go back and look at their systems and their operations and make sure that they are doing everything that they need to do to avoid liability. And, you know, and if not, they need to, if they need to make changes. That's awesome. Uh, thank you so much. That's it for today's episode of Title Agents Podcast. I want to extend great thank you to Nancy for sharing her wealth of knowledge and experience with us. If you found value in our discussion today, make sure to subscribe and leave a review and definitely share the podcast with your network. We'll be back soon with more expert insights to help you excel in the world of title insurance. Until then, keep striving for excellence in every closing. Thank you so much. In a world where change is the only constant, Mo Shamil stands at the forefront, guiding title professionals to not just grow their businesses, but to master the art of innovation. With every episode, you're handed the keys to unlock unparalleled growth and stay ahead of the curve. Get ready for a transformative journey 